Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're going to be talking all about diesel fuel and diesel engines. We're going to be answering questions like what causes diesel engines to lose power and efficiency over time? How do diesel engines work? How are modern diesel engines changing? And how does fuel have a significant impact on the way modern diesel engines operate? So first off, a huge thank you to ExxonMobil for sponsoring this video. They actually provided me access to their engineers so I could ask all kinds of questions and learn all kinds of information about diesel fuel. And I was even able to visit a third party test facility where ExxonMobil's latest diesel fuel, Synergy Diesel Efficient Fuel, was tested and I was able to see how they were able to verify the claims they made make about this fuel. So let's start at the very beginning. What is diesel fuel? Well, diesel fuel is obviously the fuel used in diesel engines, and it is a mixture of hydrocarbons of a certain range in size. So you derive this from crude oil, and crude oil has all kinds of different hydrocarbons within it. Some of them are very large, and some are much smaller. So the key is to separate them into their different categories and take out the portion that you want for diesel fuel. And so this is the distillation process, the refinery process of crude oil. So you take crude oil, you then boil that crude, heating it up to quite high temperatures, and then you send it through a distillation column. So this distillation column is warmer at the bottom and cooler at the top. So as you have this gaseous oil flowing through this distillation column, the heavier, longer molecules will condense sooner at higher temperatures, meaning they'll separate out towards the bottom versus those smaller, lighter hydrocarbons. They won't condense until much cooler temperatures, so they raise up much higher within this distillation column. And so you're able to separate out the different hydrocarbons at different layers, and hydrocarbons of various sizes have various uses. So those larger ones that come right out at the bottom, those are gonna be kind of like a tar used for road oils. A little bit higher, you get to lubricating oils. Keep moving up into smaller molecules, you get diesel fuel. Keep going even further in this refinery process, further up this distillation column, and we get gasoline. So we're looking at hydrocarbons in the C8H18 range. Eight carbons, 18 hydrogens versus diesel fuel somewhere in the range, give or take, of a C15H28. So at the top, you have those lighter molecules that condense at lower temperatures. At the bottom, you have those heavier molecules, the larger hydrocarbons that condense sooner. Now, this is the traditional way of creating diesel fuel. There are other ways to do it. So you can take those larger hydrocarbon molecules and break them apart into the size you do want to be used as diesel fuel. So what do we do with these hydrocarbons once we have them? Well, we burn them, of course, to make power. So the process is very similar to a gasoline engine, but there are distinct differences. So you have your intake, compression, power, and exhaust strokes, uh, but there's a few little differences here. So with the intake stroke, you don't have a throttle, generally speaking, that's restricting that intake air. And so as a result, you have less pumping losses and diesels tend to be significantly more efficient. For the compression stroke, you tend to use higher compression ratios because you're not using spark ignition, you're now using fuel to ignite it after that compression stroke has occurred. They also you tend to use turbochargers, uh, and as a result, they have more torque. Uh, and generally speaking, because of these higher compression ratios, they're going to be more efficient. So getting to our power stroke, instead of a spark igniting that air fuel mixture, ignition is timed based on when you inject that diesel fuel. So this is a very critical component of how this entire engine works. And then you have your exhaust cycle. And a difference versus gasoline here is that diesels tend to run very lean. As a result, they have abundant oxygen available in the exhaust, which means three-way catalytic converters like those used with gasoline engines aren't effective, so different strategies like urea injection are used. Now, I mentioned the importance of the injector, and so this is an area where modern diesels are really trying to improve, and two of the ways they're doing that are increasing the pressure, extremely high pressures, over 2,000 bar, looking towards, you know, potentially working in the 3,000 bar range, over 30,000 PSI, so significantly orders of magnitude higher than gasoline engines, and they're also looking to decrease the size of the holes used. And so the reasons for this, with that higher pressure, they're able to get better penetration within the cylinder and spread out that fuel as wide as possible, as fast as possible. Also using those very small little ports, little holes on the injector, they're able to get a very fine mist that sprays out. So the combination with high pressure and smaller injector holes means better overall efficiency and more power created through better penetration within the cylinder and a finer mist so it mixes better and burns very quickly. 
But there are also emissions benefits to using a finer mist and using higher pressures. And so if you kind of imagine, you know, this is kind of an extreme comparison here, one injecting out quite further, great cylinder penetration, really spread out the fine mist versus, you know, kind of a richer area right here. So if you think about if you were to burn all of this fuel in this area or all of this fuel in this area and you have the same quantity of fuel, because this fuel is spread out over a larger area, it's going to have lower local temperatures. All of this fuel is being burned in a much smaller area, so the overall temperature of that area is going to be higher. And because the temperature of that area is higher, more NOx emissions are going to form. NOx emissions are correlated with temperatures, so the higher you get your temperatures, then the more NOx emissions you have. So you want to bring down local cylinder temperatures, local internal temperatures within this cylinder. So you can do that by spreading out the fuel as wide as possible. The other thing is, when you're spraying it and if you don't have great penetration and it kind of just stays in this little dense area, then you have a richer air fuel mixture within this area. And what this leads to is more particulate matter forming because you don't have complete combustion occur in those richer pockets of the air fuel mixture. So the benefit is not just in power and efficiency, but also reducing particulate matter and reducing NOx emissions by having a better spray with that injector. Now here's where deposits come in and try to ruin everyone's day. So deposits in diesel engines is nothing new. It's the conditions that allow for that. So you have high temperatures and pressures and this causes that fuel to oxidize which creates deposits within the combustion chamber and around those fuel injectors. You can also have deposits form inside the nozzle as the fuel undergoes heat and pressure changes as it's cycled through the fuel system. The problem is that as modern diesel engines move towards finer and finer mists with very small holes on these injectors, then they become susceptible and very sensitive uh, to irregular spray patterns as a result of those deposits. So a very small deposit, just a few microns in size, can create meaningful impacts on that spray quality of these injectors because those ports, those injector holes, are so small. So deposits can affect the spray's pattern, they can affect the spray's penetration, and they can even affect the spray's flow. And so ultimately this can mean a reduction in power, a reduction in efficiency, and an increase in emissions. So how do we approach this deposits problem? Well, in the United States, in order for diesel fuel to be sold, it must meet the industry standard, which is ASTM D97.5. So this is the specification for diesel fuel in order for it to be sold, which includes additives and a spec of all the different qualities about this fuel in order for it to be used in the US market. So what ExxonMobil does is they take this ASTM D97.5 specification diesel fuel and they add to that their proprietary additive package. So this is what they are calling Synergy Diesel Efficient Fuel. So they mix that in, that is then put in a truck and sent to the station, the fuel station. And so ultimately what ExxonMobil's goal is with this detergent additive package is that it will reduce deposits which will improve the spray quality of those injectors and thus improve emissions and improve efficiency. Now the additive package that they're using is of course proprietary, so we don't know what the chemical formula is of these detergents used, but the whole idea behind detergents is that they'll attach to the deposits, break them apart, and then send them all downstream from the engine. And so we can ask the question, does their additive package actually work? And so the results that they were able to obtain uh, through testing was a 2% average improvement in fuel economy, a 2% reduction in CO2 emissions, and an 11% reduction in NOx emissions. So how do we know Synergy Diesel Efficient Fuel offers a meaningful benefit over the standard fuel at the pump, ASTM D97.5? Well, to find out, I visited one of the third-party research facilities where the fuel was put to the test, ranging from light-duty diesel vehicles all the way up to semi-trucks. Testing was performed on an indoors dynamometer to provide complete control over as many variables as possible. To start the test, passenger trucks were taken in with 20,000 to 50,000 miles on the odometer as well as semi-trucks with approximately 350,000 miles. Light-duty diesel engines can be expected to last around 200,000 miles or so, while larger diesels for tractor-trailer applications can last around a million miles, so vehicles were taken in with plenty of useful life remaining. These vehicles were then completely conditioned to be in perfect operating shape oil change, cleaning the diesel particulate filter, and making sure everything works as it should before the test begins. 
The vehicles then run 500 miles using a D97.5 standardized fuel to condition the engine for the start of the test. Only after these 500 miles are completed is a baseline run measured, where fuel economy and emissions data is recorded. Light duty vehicles are then run for about 5,000 miles, while larger semi trucks are ran for about 30,000 miles, all of these miles using Synergy diesel efficient fuel. After this, the data for fuel economy and emissions is measured. This is where the facility noticed that fuel consumption was improved by 2% on average, with CO2 reduced by 2% and NOx emissions reduced by 11%. Now, you might wonder, wait a minute, we're measuring a 2% difference on a chassis dynamometer? That's impossible. What's the error bar? Well, I thought the exact same thing, and this test facility actually had to incorporate some special tools to make this all possible. At the end of the day, they were able to get a 2% improvement with standard deviation of just 0.4%, meaning that statistically, the 2% claim is easy to trust. Two pieces of equipment in particular made this measurement possible, on top of all of the other many variables which were controlled. First, a torque meter at the beginning of the drive shaft was installed, so that the engine's output torque could be measured close to the source, rather than after the wheels using the dynamometer. This provides a much more accurate, repeatable test versus trying to hold torque constant that's traveling through the differentials, wheels, and tires, and the many variables that affect each of these locations. The second piece of equipment was a drive-by wire system, so that the exact throttle mapping could be matched from one test to the next. Rather than a human foot, which would have increased error significantly, a computer tells the engine exactly how much throttle and torque to make at any given time over the duration of the test, which is then repeated over and over to obtain fuel economy and emissions results. So ultimately what they found, by using Synergy diesel efficient fuel with its detergent additive package, enough deposits were removed from injector nozzles which created a significant enough difference in the fuel injector spray quality which ultimately resulted in a 2% fuel economy benefit, all with an error bar of 0.4%. Now, does 2% matter? Well, when you start to multiply that number across the number of vehicles in a fleet, as well as the reduction in emissions associated with it, it's quite a significant difference. It could also mean a reduction in the consumption of diesel exhaust fluid for engines that use NOx sensors in the after treatment and adjust how much fluid is injected based on how much NOx is present. Again, test results saw an 11% decrease in NOx emissions. And if deposits cause enough of a restriction to fuel flow, it could mean restoring top end power where max flow is needed by reducing deposits. It's important to state that these improvements come from restoring the original injector spray quality and getting the engine to run like it did when it was brand new. As someone who has worked as a test engineer before this whole YouTube thing, it was awesome to get a behind the scenes tour of the test facility and see up close just how much effort went into obtaining useful data and results. Quite impressive that they were able to get the error bar down to just 0.4% and see meaningful improvements in fuel economy and emissions. Synergy diesel efficient fuel is currently in the process of rolling out across North America where it will be available at Exxon stations and mobile stations as well as a global rollout available at Esso stations. A huge thank you to Exxon Mobile for sponsoring the video and thank you all for watching. If you have any questions or comments, of course feel free to leave those below.